Imagine a cosmic monster lurking in the depths of space, powerful enough to shred entire stars. Now imagine that same beast creating the gold in your wedding ring. Welcome to the mind-bending world of black holes, where destruction and creation dance in perfect, violent harmony. <laughs> Greetings, my celestial sleuths and cosmic confidants. Theodore here, ready to take you on a journey to the edge of space and time. Today, we're diving headfirst into the abyss, quite literally, as we explore the enigmatic realm of black holes. From the serial killers of the cosmos to the surprising creators of precious metals, these cosmic titans are full of surprises. So strap in, and let's venture where light fears to tread. Hey everyone, and welcome to this deep dive where we're going to tackle something pretty massive, so to speak, black holes. We've got some really cool new research to dig into from Hubble observations to some seriously mind-bending astrophysics. We're even going to touch on gravitational waves. Yeah, one of the biggest things right now in black hole research is that astronomers are finding way more black holes in the early universe than anyone ever expected. Yeah, it's like a, what are they calling it? A black hole bonanza. Uh-huh. Right. And these aren't just the crazy bright quasars either. We're seeing smaller, dimmer ones popping up everywhere, which is really interesting. Yeah, because that kind of throws a wrench in how we thought black holes were formed, right? Exactly. Like the classic story is that a massive star dies and collapses under its own gravity and then boom, you have a black hole. Yeah. But that whole process takes time. And these black holes we're seeing, well, they just didn't have the time to form after the Big Bang. Whoa, hold your horses, space cowboys. Let me break this down for you. Imagine you're baking cookies, but instead of waiting an hour, they're done in seconds. That's kind of what's happening with these early black holes. They're popping up faster than we thought possible, and it's making us question everything we know about cosmic baking. I mean, black hole formation. It's like the universe is running on cheat codes, and we're still trying to figure out the game. I mean, we're talking billions of years ago, right? That's where Hubble comes in. Its deep field observations are essential for this sort of research, you know, where they pointed at what looks like a completely empty patch of sky and just let it gather light for days. It's amazing that we can even see that far back. It is. It really is like looking at the universe's baby pictures. So what's the leading theory on how these early black holes came to be if the dying star idea doesn't work? One idea that's gaining traction is called direct collapse where you have these huge, and I mean huge clouds of gas that collapse really quickly and form a black hole. But it does kind of depend on dark matter, which is a whole other thing. Okay, so we have direct collapse, which could explain how fast these black holes are forming, but then we have to figure out dark matter. But isn't there some even weirder stuff out there? Like, what about those dark stars we hear about sometimes? Those still sound like something straight out of Star Wars to me, ha ha. But seriously, stars powered by dark matter, not fusion. That's wild. It's an idea that more and more researchers are looking at because yeah. it could solve a lot of problems, including how these early black holes formed. I mean, imagine a star that's fueled by dark matter instead of fusion. It could grow way bigger, yeah. way faster than a normal star. And when it collapses, boom, you've got a massive black hole in a fraction of the time. OK, that is just really, really cool. It really makes you wonder just how much dark matter has shaped the early universe. And who knows, maybe the James Webb telescope will be able to spot some of these dark stars and we can finally get some answers. Yeah, that would be incredible. Speaking of ancient black holes, I think we have to talk about our very own celebrity black hole, Sagittarius A. Uh, yes, Sagittarius A, the enigma at the center of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty popular target for a lot of telescopes right now. It is. I mean, that image from the Event Horizon Telescope a while back was incredible. But what they found out about Sagittarius A's spin is even more intriguing. Yeah, it's spinning way faster than it should be. And it's not even spinning in the same direction as the rest of the Milky Way. Mm. It's like someone just took a pool cue to it. Huh? Yeah, something like that. It really shouldn't be spinning the way it is. Which has led some to believe that Sagittarius A was created when the Milky Way collided with another galaxy. Or at least a black hole from another galaxy. 
billions of years ago. I mean, we've talked about Gaia and Celadus, that dwarf galaxy that the Milky Way essentially ate, so it stands to reason that maybe that's where this other black hole came from. Space is brutal. It can be, but we wouldn't have it any other way. That's true. Now, for something a little different, a serial killer black hole, I mean, you can't make the stuff up. I know, it's like something straight out of a nightmare. But this is very real and very interesting. So what happened? Well, the Chandra X-ray Telescope observed this black hole absolutely ripping a star apart. Talk about spaghettification. Right. But not only that, it then flung the leftover star stuff, it, something else nearby. We're not even sure what it threw it at, another star or maybe even a smaller black hole. But either way, yikes. So how did we figure out that this happened? It's not like black holes emit light. Well, they might not emit light, but they do emit other things, specifically x-rays. These x-rays that we observed had a really distinct pattern. It's called quasi-periodic oscillations, or QPOs, and they're like a fingerprint for this kind of event. Like, imagine a flickering light, but instead of light, it's x-rays. It's kind of like that. So it's like cosmic CSI piecing together clues to figure out what happened. That's so cool. But now it's time to get really weird. How do we listen to a black hole? And I mean that literally. Uh -huh. You're talking about gravitational waves. Of course. What else would it be? But seriously, tell me everything. What are they? How do they work? And why should we care? I mean, we're talking about ripples in space time here. Right. It's mind blowing. So basically, imagine space time as this giant trampoline. And then imagine really heavy objects like black holes mm -hmm. or bowling balls on this trampoline. OK, I'm with you. Keep going. As these bowling balls move around, they distort the trampoline, creating these ripples that we call gravitational waves. These waves are literally distortions in space-time caused by the movement of these massive objects. And the coolest part is Einstein predicted them like 100 years ago, and we've only recently been able to actually detect them. That's incredible. But how can we even detect them? They're so faint, right? Very faint. But we have instruments like LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which is specifically designed to pick up these faint waves. And speaking of these waves, we've got this other really cool thing, this gravitational wave background. It's like the universe is producing this constant hum of gravitational waves. Wait, so it's not just black holes colliding that produce these waves. There's something else out there. Well, every time two black holes collide anywhere in the universe, it creates these waves. And over billions of years, all of these waves add up and create this constant background noise, like a cosmic hum that permeates the universe. All right, picture this. You're at a cosmic concert, but instead of music, you're listening to the universe itself. These gravitational waves are like the bass drops of space. They're subtle, they're powerful, and they're telling us the life stories of stars and black holes billions of light years away. It's like eavesdropping on the universe's most intimate conversations. Who knew space could be such a gossip? That is definitely something I'm going to be thinking about for a while. We all are. So we've got a black hole bonanza, a runaway black hole, and the cosmic symphony. Where do we even go from here? Don't worry, we've got plenty more to talk about, including those neutron stars you mentioned. Turns out they're even weirder than we thought. You're killing me. So we were talking about these gravitational waves and how they're basically ripples in space-time, which is already kind of mind-blowing. But it turns out they can also tell us how heavy things are, even things that are billions of light years away, like neutron stars. Yeah, that's one of the really cool things about gravitational waves. They carry so much information. So how does that work? It's not like we have a cosmic scale hanging around. Uh-huh, no, but it's kind of like that. When two neutron stars get close, really close, their gravity starts to warp space-time, creating those waves. Right, like we were talking about with the trampoline analogy. Exactly. And those waves, they carry information about the neutron stars, including how massive they are. By analyzing the waves, we can basically weigh these super dense objects from across the universe. Okay, so we can weigh a neutron star. Why is that a big deal? Well, neutron stars are weird. They're like giant atomic nuclei, just incredibly dense. And figuring out their mass helps us figure out how they work, what they're made of, all that good stuff. It's like a giant physics lab, but instead of a lab, it's a dead star. Exactly. Speaking of dead stars and things that are really far away, remember those early black holes we were talking about? The ones that kind of break the traditional dying star model? Oh yeah, those are a real head scratcher. Well, one of the models we touched on was that direct collapse model where you have this massive cloud of gas that just sort of 
goes straight to black hole without ever becoming a star. Right. And that would kind of explain why we see them so early in the universe's history. Exactly. But how does that even work? What could cause something that big to just collapse in on itself like that? You guessed it. Dark matter. Ugh. Dark matter. Always the mysterious friend. Always. But in this case, it might be more like a cosmic catalyst. Imagine this huge cloud of gas just hanging out in the early universe and surrounding it is this halo of dark matter. We can't see it, but we know it's there. Okay, got it. So as the gas cloud gets pulled in by its own gravity, it starts pulling in some of that dark matter too, and that speeds up the whole process. It's like giving it an extra gravitational kick. So instead of slowly collapsing and maybe forming a star, it's like hitting the fast forward button and going straight to black hole. Exactly. That's kind of terrifying when you think about it. Just a little bit, yeah. But let's bring it back down to Earth, or at least a little closer to home. What about Sagittarius A? our friendly neighborhood supermassive black hole. What's new with that? Well, besides it spinning like a top that's about to fall over, which is weird enough on its own, mm. we're also seeing a lot of activity around it, like those quasi-periodic oscillations. Well, the QPOs, right. Those are like the flickering lights of the universe or something, right? Yeah, it's kind of like that. These are X-ray emissions. They come from the area right around the black hole. And these X-rays, they're like, what? Coming from stuff that's about to fall into the black hole? Pretty much. Imagine clumps of matter, gas and dust, orbiting the black hole super fast. As they orbit, they heat up, get stretched and squeezed by those insane gravitational forces, and emit these bursts of X-rays that we pick up here on Earth. So each burst, that's like one orbit. It's possible. We're still figuring all that out. But by studying these QPOs, we could actually learn a lot about the black hole itself, like its spin and mass. It's amazing what we can learn from a few flickering X-rays billions of years old. But speaking of learning things, I think we've got time to talk about one more mind-blowing concept. The idea that black holes and neutron stars, these things that seem to destroy everything in their path, might actually be responsible for creating some of the most important stuff in the universe, including the things that make up you and me. It's true, and it all comes down to these things called kilonovas. Which are? <laughs> Don't leave me hanging. No, sorry. A kilonova is basically what happens when two neutron stars collide. Okay, but neutron stars, those are already extreme, right? Like, more massive than the sun, but packed into something the size of a city. Yeah, and when those things collide, it's not pretty. Well, it's probably the most awesome thing anyone could ever see, but in a very destructive way. Okay. But, and this is the cool part, all that energy has to go somewhere, and a lot of it goes into creating heavier elements. Hold on. Are you saying that stuff like gold and platinum, the things we value so much, are actually byproducts of neutron stars crashing into each other? Exactly. The amount of heat and pressure during one of these kilonovas is insane, and it acts like a giant cosmic forge, fusing atoms together to make all sorts of heavy elements. So the gold in my wedding ring could have been forged billions of years ago in a collision of neutron stars. Hold on to your jewelry, folks, because this is where things get really wild. That shiny ring on your finger? It's not just a symbol of love. It's a cosmic hand-me-down from the most violent events in the universe. Neutron stars colliding, forging gold in their cosmic furnace. It's like the universe's way of saying, here's a little something to remember me by. Talk about old family heirlooms. That's mind-blowing. But how do we know this is even happening? I mean, we can barely see neutron stars as it is. That's where things like gamma ray telescopes come in. These kilonovas, they don't just produce heavy elements. They also release an insane amount of energy in the form of gamma rays which we can detect here on Earth. So it's like a giant cosmic beacon that tells us, hey, something really cool just happened over here. Exactly. And the more we learn about kilonovas, the more we realize that black holes and neutron stars, they aren't just these agents of chaos. They're also essential for creating the very building blocks of, well, everything. It's kind of poetic when you think about it. It really is. Well, I think we've just about reached the event horizon of our deep dive into black holes. We've covered a lot of ground from the early universe to our own galactic backyard. And one thing is for sure, black holes are a lot weirder and more important than we ever could have imagined. I completely agree. The more we learn, the more we realize how much we don't know, which is exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. And who knows what amazing discoveries await us just beyond the next scientific breakthrough. From everyone here at The Deep Dive, thanks for joining us on this incredible journey, and remember to keep looking up. Well, my 
starry-eyed companions, we've journeyed from the dawn of the universe to the violent collisions that created your bling. Black holes, it turns out, are not just cosmic vacuum cleaners, but also the universe's most extreme recycling program. They destroy, they create, and they keep the cosmos in a constant state of chaotic balance. As we sign off, remember, every time you look up at the night sky, you're witnessing a cosmic drama billions of years in the making. Keep wondering, keep exploring, and who knows, maybe one day we'll unlock all of the universe's dark secrets. Until next time, this is Theodore, signing off and always looking up.